Good morning and welcome to First Church of Christ at Home. We are so glad that you're watching. Uh, my name is David. I'm the pastor here at First Church and it's so good to be with you. Today's service is meant to be interactive and so go ahead and take a minute right now to say hi there in the online chat. Maybe tell us your name, how many are worshiping with you there. Uh, that's a big help to us and it's a real encouragement too. We, we want to know who's joining us online each week. Also, please take a moment to fill out the Digital Connect card by clicking on the appropriate tab or link there. And if you have any specific prayer needs that you'd like to share, there's a link there for you to submit those as well. We would just count it an honor and a privilege to pray with you throughout the week. Uh, this morning, we're going to be continuing on in our series of messages, Jesus' Final Week, Seven Days of Stress. In just a little bit, I'm going to be sharing the fifth message entitled, he established a memorial where we're going to be considering the Last Supper. And then at the conclusion of the message, we're going to be sharing in a time of communion together. And so if you haven't done so already, uh, maybe take a moment to grab some, some juice and some crackers so that you'll be ready to participate. I really believe the Lord is going to speak to your heart and encourage you today. I also want to say thank you to everyone who gives to support the ministry and mission of First Church you make it possible for the gospel message to continue to go out. All righty, are you ready to worship? Here we go. We want to welcome you guys and put our hands together. Let's continue to praise our God. He is worthy, amen.
Wouldn't it be wonderful if we knew the future? 
I mean, wouldn't it be great if we knew in advance the names of the people our children would marry someday, if we knew what the stock market was going to do, or if we knew for certain who's going to win this year's NCAA basketball championship game. Most of us think those things would be really good. We'd be so much calmer, richer, uh, self-assured. That's why we buy books that try to predict future trends. That's why palm readers, prognosticators, astrologers make good money pretending to foresee the future. While thumbing through a magazine in the waiting room of a doctor's office, uh, office recently, I, I saw an advertisement for an 800 number that you could dial up and receive your daily horoscope. For just a few dollars, someone could tell you what kind of day you're going to have, supposedly. Now, actually, life would be terrible if we knew the future. God tells us in his word not to consult the medium or astrologers. Not only is that a waste of time, but it wouldn't be to our benefit if we did know what was going to happen. Uh, that would take a lot of the joy and excitement out of life. You know, don't date her. She's going to break your heart in three months. Or, hey, don't go to that game. We're going to lose by 12 points. Hey, don't go to church this Sunday. The sermon is no good. <laughs> you see, the instant replay is never as exciting as the live action. If we knew what the future held, we'd wait until the very last minute to do some of the things that we ought to do much in advance. And we would be very depressed, probably, about what was going to happen in the future. I mean, can't you just hear people saying, Oh, I, I dread next year. I, I dread 2023. That's the year I have a serious operation. That's the year my, that my mother dies and my children get a divorce. And, and, and they wouldn't appreciate 2022 at all. You know, every time that I went to the dentist when I was younger, he would always ask me how my wisdom teeth were doing. And he always said, now, if you begin to have trouble with one of them, then we're going to take out all four of them at the same time. And he often added, do you know why we're going to take all four at once? Well, because if you only take two of them, you'll never have the other two removed, he said. And you know what? He was right. I've had just one removed, and I'm not really thrilled with the prospect of ever having to have any of the others removed. You see, sometimes we're better off not knowing what is coming up. God was very protective when he created us with, with limited capacity to know what's going to happen tomorrow. If we did, that would put unbearable pressure on us. But Jesus Christ knew what was going to happen in the future. I mean, he was God in the flesh, and he knew exactly what was going to happen to him. And he lived his final hours knowing that in just a few hours, he was going to be crucified. In fact, in Matthew 26, verse 2, Jesus said, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Haven't you wondered at times what it would be like to be on death row and to know exactly the hour of your execution? I mean, those final hours have to be horrible. Those final steps to the electric chair have buckled even the proudest of men. Well, Jesus not only knew when he was going to die, he knew how he was going to die. He was going to go through the most excruciating torture imaginable in a crucifixion. But even worse than that, he was going to bear on his shoulders the sins of the entire world. For the first time in all of eternity, he was going to experience separation from the Father. He was going to experience hell on our behalf. And we can't even imagine the kind of stress that he must have been under during those final hours. But despite that pressure, he demonstrated concern for his followers. At a time when he could rightfully expect people to minister to him, he was reaching out to others. And his calmness under pressure is very apparent on this final night when he instituted the Lord's Supper. And so let's examine that account as it's found in Mark, the 14th chapter, beginning with verse 12. And I want us today to develop a deeper appreciation of what Jesus endured for us, but also to have a deeper appreciation of what the Lord's Supper is supposed to commemorate. I want you to see first his preparation for the Last Supper. 
Uh, look at Mark, the 14th chapter, beginning with verse 12 that reads, On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparation for you to eat the Passover? Now, if I had been Jesus, that request would have, would have exasperated me somewhat. I mean, he had been training these men uh, for what? Uh, three years now to accept positions of responsibility. They were going to be the leaders in the church. It was now time for, for them to, uh, to take charge. It was time that they showed some compassion for him. I mean, this would have been a great time for the disciples to say, Jesus, we know you've, we know you've, been a, uh, on, you've got a lot on your mind these days. Uh, we, we, and so we've taken care of all the details of the Passover. Don't you worry about a thing. And yet in his hour of greatest need, they came to him saying, Hey, uh, what do you want us to do about the Passover? It's tomorrow, you know. Haven't you made any arrangements yet? Uh, this is kind of like a mother packing her clothes to go to the hospital for a serious operation. And her husband says to her, Hey, have you made any arrangements for somebody to cut the grass while you're gone? Uh, it, it, would be a, uh, it would be hard to be patient at a time like that. But Jesus was. He didn't explode and say, what is wrong with you guys? Won't you ever mature? Won't you ever care about somebody other than yourselves? Uh, look at verse 13 and see that Jesus had already gone to, to great detail to prepare for the Last Supper. Uh, so, uh, verse 13 says, So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Now, usually the women carried the water, and it would be unusual to see a man carrying a jar of water. But this was Jesus' signal through this man that he would lead them to a special place. And keep in mind that there was a bounty on Jesus' head at this point. And if the enemies could find him at night away from the crowds, why, they'd arrest him on the spot. Jesus was moving under the cover of darkness, and he would surrender to his enemies on his time schedule, not theirs. And so he'd arrange for this friend to be carrying this jar of water. And he said, uh, you follow him and say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations there. You see how Jesus had cared for all the details in advance? He delegated out what exactly was to be delegated to others. This was going to be a very important night and he'd left nothing to chance. So the disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. If the Lord's Supper is going to be meaningful for us, there needs to be some advance preparation. And I'm not sure there always is. In fact, if you could probably bug the average Christian home on Sunday morning and just kind of listen in, I think you would hear something like, you know, sound something like this. Will you get up? If you don't get up in 30 seconds, I'm going to come in there and I'm going to pour a pitcher of water on you. Or would you hurry up in there? It's gonna, is it going to take you all day? Or how come my toast is burned again? Oh no, you spilled again. Why always on Sunday morning? Or has anybody seen my Bible? I can't find it. Well, that shows how much you read your Bible during the week, Dad. Or I'm going to go out and start the car, and if you're not out there in two minutes, I'm going to leave without you. I swear, some Sunday morning I'm going to go to church without you and then explain to everybody uh, that's there why it is that I'm late every Sunday. Because you're not ready. Or, George, if you would just help out with the kids a little instead of barking out orders all the time, maybe we would be ready. Or would you turn off that radio? Hearing one sermon on Sunday morning is plenty for anybody. 
And if you had the car bugged on Sunday morning, you'd hear the kids bickering. Mom, tell him to get his feet off of me. Well, I don't have my feet on her. She's running into my feet. Jimmy, get your feet off of her. And the family drives into the parking lot. Uh, we're already five minutes late. Oh man, look at that. Somebody's got my parking spot. They know that's where I always park. And finally, they find a place to park, and they get out of the car, and Mom says, Okay, everybody, let's at least smile and look happy anyhow. And that family walks into church, and they sit in the aisle across from you. And you look over at them, and they look so together. And your wife kind of nudges you and says, Look at that family. Why can't we be more like that? And you go over to them after church and you say, I've just got to compliment you. You've got such a beautiful family. You all come in so prepared for church and you look so great. And they say, well, thank you very much. The Lord has really been good to us and we try to worship the way that He wants us to. <sighs> Sunday is a hectic day for a lot of people. And not just families either. It's true of single people and elderly couples as well. We rush into church unprepared. And it takes us 20 minutes or so to even settle down. And by that time, it's time for the Lord's Supper, and we're not ready to concentrate on the meaning of it at all. If worship and communion are going to mean something special, there needs to be some preparation. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together as my followers, I'm right there among them. And our advanced preparation should communicate that we know just how special He is. And then notice, secondly, the participants in the Lord's Supper. Jesus not only made advanced preparations, but he also had to participate with some very imperfect people. Look at verse 17, which reads, When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve, and while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Now, when you're under stress, you want your friends to be loyal to you. But in this most pressure-packed moment, Jesus had to deal with the traitor in his midst. In fact, John says that Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. You see, Judas had already made arrangements with Jesus' enemies to lead them to Christ after dark. Not only was Judas a traitor, he was a clever sneak. I mean, nobody suspected him. When Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, nobody said, I know who it is. It's Judas. I've been watching him, and he's got a bad attitude. And he's been stealing out of the treasury, I think. No. Everybody said, Lord, is it me? Now, if I'd been Jesus, I would have said, no, it's not you, it's Judas. I mean, haven't you seen him pouting? Haven't you seen him undercutting me? Haven't you seen him conniving with the enemy? He's driving me up a wall. But look at verse 20. Jesus replied, it is one of the twelve, the one who dips bread into the bowl with me. And he's going to single out Judas privately. He said, the Son of Man will go just as it's written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. And so Jesus was making a, a, a final appeal to Judas in these last moments. He was giving yet another opportunity for him to repent. He was saying, in essence, Judas, it's going to happen. You don't have to be involved. And I think Jesus would have singled out Judas would have singled out Judas in public if he would have done that. Judas would have never left that upper room alive. Peter had a sword, and Peter wasn't afraid to use it. But Judas wasn't the only imperfect disciple there that night. Peter wasn't exactly always loyal either. Look at Mark 14, beginning with verse 27, where Jesus said, 
You will all fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, today. Yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And don't you think that Peter must have got on Jesus' nerves on occasion? I mean, he was such a know-it-all, always bragging about how strong he was. And if I were Jesus, I would be tempted to say, Peter, you're such a bozo. I mean, you're always bragging about how strong you are. How many times are you going to blow it before you're finally humbled? But Luke tells us that Jesus warned Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And even though Jesus knew that Peter was going to fail him, he still calmly sought to reinforce him. And he still gave him communion too. That is amazing compassion and composure. James and John were about to take communion too. Luke's account tells us that during the Last Supper, a dispute arose among the disciples. They were bickering over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. James and John usually initiated that dispute. I mean, they were always concerned about power and about influence. You know what? If a couple of the elders came to me and they said, Hey, David, we've got a special request. We want to have special parking places right by the front door on Sunday mornings so we don't have to fight the weather so much. You know, if those men made that request of me, I'd really be disappointed because what they're really saying is, we're more important than anybody else. Let the other people fight the rainy days. We want the important places. I'd be disappointed. And I'd probably give them the lecture, we're not the exception, we are to be the example. I mean, how disappointing it must have been for Jesus to hear the disciples asking about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. I mean, he must have wondered, have they caught nothing of what I've tried to teach them? He said, I am among you as one who serves. Let the greatest among you be the servant of all. And then Jesus distributed the Last Supper to some very imperfect people. Boy, is it important that we remember that when we take communion. When you come into the church and you sit down and you look around you, you'll see some imperfect people. You'll see people who have been immoral. You'll see people who maybe have hurt you, abused some of your friends. And if you're not careful, those people can make a barrier between you and the Lord. Mark 11 verse 25 says, When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. You see, communion is not just a time for us to ask God to forgive us. It's a time for us to practice forgiveness to others, too. A preacher friend of mine told of a woman who called him up on a Monday morning and said, Preacher, did you notice that I didn't take communion yesterday during worship? He said, Well, no, I didn't notice. She said, Well, I didn't, and I'm going to tell you why. In the prayer time, in your prayer list, you forgot to mention my aunt. And I was so exasperated when, you, when communion came my way that I didn't even take it because I knew I shouldn't take communion with an unforgiving spirit. Indeed, she said, the Bible says if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, you leave your gift at the altar and you go and be reconciled to your brother. And then you come back and worship, she said. So, hey, I didn't take communion. Well, you know what? The woman was probably right in not taking the Lord's Supper when she had such a vindictive spirit. But it would have been so much better for her if she would have just bowed her head and said, Lord, 
the preacher forgot somebody who's really important to me today. Help me to forgive him the way that you forgive me when I forget so many times. Times when I forget you. Then she could have taken communion in a worthy manner. You see, communion is not just a time for asking God to forgive you. It's a time for you to forgive others. But it's usually not the imperfection of others that disturbs us at communion. It's our own imperfections. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks of the cup. When we examine ourselves, we are aware of our own sin. We're aware of how far short we fall. And we're tempted to say, I've asked God to forgive me in this area of sin so many times. Maybe I ought to just pass it up. I'm not worthy. But remember, Jesus gave communion to Peter, who was going to deny him. He gave communion to James and John, who were egotistical. And I think that if Judas had not left early, Jesus would have given communion to him as well. An usher passed communion to a woman who was dressed in a, in a very worldly way. And she had her head bowed, uh, and she was sobbing. But he placed the communion in front of her, and he whispered to her, Go ahead and take it. It's for us sinners. And when we partake of the communion in just a little bit, go ahead and take it. I mean, it was for Peter. It was for James and John. And it's for me. Therefore, it's for you. But it's for repentant sinners. And we need to hear the words of Jesus, I think, to the adulterous woman when he says, Neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. And then Jesus communicated to his disciples the exact purpose of the communion as well. Both the bread and the cup were symbolic of his imminent death on the cross. Verse 22 reads, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Now, one of the rules of interpreting the Bible is to take it literally, if possible, figuratively, if obvious. And there are times that Jesus obviously spoke figuratively when he said, I am the door. Or, I am the light. And while he was with them in person, when he said, this is my body, we think that he was speaking figuratively. Like, like we would say, maybe pointing to a picture up on the fireplace mantle, this is my mother. Well, actually, it's a representation of our mother. And Jesus said, this is my body. And then he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Now, there was an old covenant that God had. The Old Testament covenant was that if a man obeyed God's rules exactly, he would be saved. And if he disobeyed any of them, he'd be lost. And Jesus said, I'm going to make a new covenant. And that is, I'm going to pour out my blood for you so that even though you're imperfect, you still can be saved. I give this so that you will remember me. I read a post on uh, Facebook just a couple of days before Valentine's Day this year. It was posted from a husband who stated that his wife kept leaving him post-it notes in places where he would find them. Each one of them a reminder that Valentine's Day was just a couple of days away. And you know, Valentine's Day is just one of those days during the year that it's not real wise for a husband to forget. And somehow, we need those little signposts along the way to remind us even of those things that are important. I mean, communion is a weekly signpost for us, reminding us of what we soon forget, even though we love Him. You know what? The Lord's Supper reveals the wisdom of God because it's so simple. 
The Bible says that God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise, the weak things of the world to shame the strong. If we're going to make a memorial to, to somebody and, and we want it to last, we use concrete or we use marble. God chose crackers and grape juice. And it has lasted for 2,000 years. It's just remarkable, the simplicity of the, the communion. And the Lord's Supper reflects the wisdom of God because it's so meaningful. I mean, the unleavened bread is flesh-colored, and the wine is blood-colored. The bread is broken as we chew it, reminding us that Jesus' body was broken. Now, not a bone in his body was broken, but it was pierced, the Bible says, from the lacerations from the crown of thorns on his skull to the puncture wounds in his feet from the nails. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, Isaiah says. He was pierced for our transgressions. Now, the grape juice is produced by crushing grapes, reminding us that Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. And as the juice flows from the glass, so we are reminded that the blood of Jesus flowed from his veins for our healing. And the Lord's Supper is so available. I mean, almost anybody can afford grape juice and crackers. It's not very expensive. There's nothing rare about these elements. Its beauty is seen in its simplicity and its availability. And it's also very portable. You know, if you want to visit a memorial to Abraham Lincoln, you'd probably go to Washington, D.C. If you want to visit a memorial to Lenin, you would go to Moscow. But these emblems are so portable. I mean, we have these prepackaged cups we've been using during the pandemic. Uh, the, the emblems are so portable that they can be taken literally anywhere. When I was a student in Bible college, a bunch of us guys took off for the Smoky Mountains one weekend to go on a camping trip. And there was no church up there on the trail that was gathered to, to take communion that Sunday morning. And so we had the Lord's Supper around the campfire at our campsite. I mean, it's so portable. Alger Fitch wrote, The table is so high that it reaches heaven. It is so low that the humblest child of God can sit here. So long that it reaches from the upper room in Jerusalem to the end of history. So broad there is room for everyone of God's family. And you can also see the wisdom of God in that it was so instructional. Those of you who are school teachers know that if you can involve the other senses other than hearing, if you can have visual aids, it is much more instructional and it will jar the memory more. And have you ever thought about the fact that almost all five of the senses are involved in the Lord's Supper? We see it and we feel it and we smell it and we taste it. And as we chew it, we hear it. I, you know, I've got some favorite sounds, probably like some of you do. Uh, my heart thrills at the sound of my grandkids laughing and having fun. But one of my favorite sounds uh, is the sound of my wife stirring a pan of fudge on a stove and popping a bag of popcorn on a Saturday night so that we can eat it while we're watching a good movie. And I love the sound of laughter in church. But one of my all-time favorite sounds, a sound that I've missed so much during this pandemic, is the sound of the click of communion cups in the tray during a quiet communion service. Because that sound is a reminder to me that individually we are remembering that Jesus died for me and for you. And the Lord's Supper is so, also so inspirational. In verse 25, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. 
I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of God. You see, the Lord's Supper is not just a sad memorial to a martyr who died years ago. It is a reminder that Christ conquered that grave and is one day going to return in victory. 1 Corinthians 11:26 says, Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And when you tilt your head back to drink of the Lord's cup, it's a reminder that one day you are going to tilt your head back and you're going to look up and you are going to see Jesus coming in power and victory. And that day, He is going to make all things right. Isaiah said in Isaiah 2.4, He will judge between uh, the nations and will settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Back in the early 70s when I was just a kid, we had neighbors who kept their Christmas lights burning long into January. I mean, it was so long that they kept their outside Christmas lights burning that we began and the neighbors began to make comments about it. And we began to say, you know, if I was too lazy to take down my Christmas lights, I sure wouldn't keep them up so long. Well, those lights burned into February and then into March. And then one day, we finally understood why. Because on that day, they had a sign on the door that read, Welcome home, Jimmy. You see, their son had been a soldier in Vietnam, and they had kept the Christmas lights burning, waiting for him to come back. When we take communion, for us, on a weekly basis, it is a, a weekly vigil that says, Lord, we know you are going to come back for us someday. You see, the world under stress drinks to forget. The Christian under stress drinks to remember. We remember that Christ died to forgive us our sins, and we remember that He has promised to return someday to make all things right. Look at the last verse of our chapter here, verse 26, which reads, When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You know, when you are under stress, music can be the language of the heart. I mean, it can rip at your heartstrings. If you're grief-stricken, you come to church, and when you sing, maybe the floodgates of tears open up. There is something about music that just reaches the heart. And I wonder if Jesus had to bite his lip when he stood in a circle with those 11 men, and they sang, and he knew he was singing with them for the last time. And he left that room to die. And as we partake of the Lord's Supper today, let's make it a special time of remembrance. Remember that communion is for sinners. Remember that his body was broken, that, that his blood was shed. Remember that one day he's going to return and he is going to make all things right. And would you remember what a special person Jesus is? Under the most severe stress imaginable, He reached out to us, even though He knew exactly what the future held for Him. He gave us this memorial for our edification and for our inspiration. The body of Abraham Lincoln was transported across the country by train. The funeral car was draped with American flags. And as it went through one town, a black woman held up her child on her shoulders so that he could see the funeral car of Abraham Lincoln. And she said to her son, Honey, take a long look. That's the man who died to set you free. In just a few moments after I pray, Music is going to play. And as it does, before you partake of the bread and the juice, 
I want you to really take a little bit of time to look at it. I mean, take a long look today because they are in memory of the one who died to set you free from sin and death. He died to give you life and give it to you abundantly. Let's pray. Lord, right now we take the time to remember your great sacrifice for our sins. We remember your broken body and shed blood, not for anything you did wrong, but because you were paying the penalty for our sins. And Before we take the bread and drink the cup, we repent of any sins that we have committed before you. And we also don't take this lightly, but we recognize how precious and holy this moment is. We want to take a moment just to thank you for your sacrifice and, and to thank you for the result of your sacrifice. We not only remember it, but we rejoice over it. And we thank you that because of what you did for us, we can have our sins forgiven and have access to eternal life. Thank you for loving us enough to pay the greatest price for our redemption. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's continue in worship tonight. Oh, how high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you hide? Oh, how far I'd scale the valleys if you grace the other side. And oh, how long have I chased rivers and lowly seas to where they rise against the rush of grace descending from the source of its supply. In the highlands and the heartache, be the more or less inclined. Oh, I would certainly stop at nothing. You're just not that hard to find. Oh. Praise you in the valleys all the same You know less 
Come the pastures we call grace A mighty river flowing upwards From a deep but empty grave Sing this And I will praise you on the mountain, God And I will praise you when the mountains in my way You're the summit where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same You're no less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is We receive, we agree, amen. Ah. 